Karen Phelps, good morning. Congratulations. Thank you, Barry. And thank you for joining us after such a big night. Um, not only did you win, but you're now part of Australian history. Did you see that part of it coming? Well, I knew that if I was able to win the election, and we always thought it was a long shot, that it would, it would have to make history because it, it would have to you know, be the first time that anyone other than the Liberal Party had owned their seat since 1944. And, uh, and certainly it hasn't been won by uh, a, you know, a non-Liberal candidate since 1901. So it, it was going to be a, a major a major victory if it did happen. And you talked about it as being a pop-up campaign. It was quite late in the piece that you decided to run. Were you genuinely torn? Oh, absolutely, because it was the farthest thing from my mind <laughs> until Malcolm Turnbull was dumped. And then everywhere I went in the streets in, in the eastern suburbs, somebody would be coming up to me and saying, would you please have a run at Wentworth? And, you know, Jackie and I had to sit down and as a family we had to talk about what that would mean, what the implications would be uh, to our lives and to, uh, you know, to the fact that we, I'd have to be spending so much time in Canberra. Of course, I've done that before through the AMA uh, some years ago but uh, it wasn't something that I had in my forward plans at all. And so the, the other thing that we had to consider was whether we could main, m mount a, a complete campaign infrastructure within a three-week period. And so I wasn't prepared to actually make the decision and announce that I would do it until we knew with, that we could do it properly. How did you do that? How did you finance it? Well, Jackie and I were prepared to underwrite it, and then being a grassroots campaign, we, uh, we asked for crowdfunding, and people started donating small and larger amounts of money to, to help us out because they shared the vision. They wanted to see the Liberals sent a message, and they wanted to see me as their representative for Wentworth in Canberra. Now, 17.7% .7 must have felt like Mount Everest at times during the campaign. Were, were there moments of despondency? Oh, look, of course. I mean, things went up and down and up and down for the first couple of weeks. And, you know, it went from uh, from this is impossible to, oh, well, just maybe we'll scrape over to it'll be close. And then as the last week went by, it became more and more evident that a momentum was building. And even yesterday, I wasn't entirely sure that the momentum would be enough to get us over the line to, to such a... Uh, to such a win. Uh, as the day further progressed and I was getting reports in from, from our booth captains uh, and they were saying, you know, there's a really strongly positive mood out there, people want to see change, and we thought that maybe it would be possible, but it really wasn't until we saw the numbers on the screen last night that, uh, that I could confidently say that, that we had it won. Well, you say the sacking of Malcolm Turnbull is what got you into the, the thing in the first place, but in that last week or two, with the Malcolm Turnbull issue to one side, what, what was it, do you think, that changed that mood? Well, there was, there was a, a sequence of events that happened that, you know, people just became utterly exasperated with the Liberal Party. First of all, they seemed to be only interested in their own self-interest. They only seemed to, to want to talk about their leadership challenges and their factional battles. And, you know, it's like, hang on a second, we're out here, we're the Australian people, we want you to focus on our issues. Uh, the Religious Freedoms Report was, was something that was quite early on an issue. I called for that to be released. The government had been sitting on that for, for five months and doing nothing about it and refusing to release it. And uh, then when there was a, a, a leak and a suggestion that gay kids would be uh, thrown out of school if someone found out they were gay, that caused an outrage. But then they reversed that pretty quickly. Oh, well, of course they had to because, mm. you know, they got, they got found out. You know, they, they were trying to, to sit on that. Uh, there were then a whole lot of other issues. I mean, the, the Pauline Hanson motion in the Senate where senators from the Liberal Party voted on that it's OK to be white motion. You know, people said, what's going on there? And then the next day, their best excuse was, oops, we didn't mean to. We didn't actually read the motion. Now, that's shambolic government. You know, that is poor governance. And so people were saying, well, you know, how can you possibly explain that? How can you call yourself a responsible government and do that sort of thing? You well, know, and then... well, accepting then that, that it was shambolic, how does, how does it now help that we have a hung parliament? Well, what helps is that you have responsible crossbenchers who are prepared to uh, discuss issues on their merits to actually bring it back to the issues that the people of Australia 
want the government to be focusing on. And, and I believe that having now uh, the uh, a hung parliament, uh, then the crossbenchers then become a very important element in the decision-making process. And it's not just a, a decision about uh, what legislation gets in, voted on in which way, but it's really about the agenda that is set and, and the responses that the government needs to make to what the people are saying through their representatives on the crossbench. So how do you feel now about the, um, the, the prospect of a no-confidence vote in the government? How, how would you respond to that? I haven't changed my view to that. I mean, we saw that kind of recklessness last week with people voting on motions that they hadn't read and didn't understand. And, uh, and that's not how I operate. I, I need to have evidence. I need to see a full brief. I need to know what uh, I'm voting on. And to talk about voting one way or another on a hypo hypothetical motion uh, in the future would, would be similarly careless. Then can I take it from that that you're comfortable that this government should go full term and the election be in May next year? I've certainly said that I think that the government and all governments should go full term unless there are exceptional circumstances. And, you know, the, the next election is due in May next year and, uh, and that's time enough. And just on one issue, on, on the, the prospect of legislation to deal with the asylum seekers issue, if the government was to try and legislate um, so that the, uh, that the refugees would go to New Zealand, but then they would close the back door, they would prevent those refugees from ever going to Australia, do you think that's a pragmatic approach, that that's the way to go? First order of business is to get the kids off Nauru with their families to Australia for urgent medical and psychological help. And I join the AMA's call and my thousands of colleagues who have been calling for this, and I believe that should be a first order of business. The resettlement options should be explored, and New Zealand is an extremely good option, and it's definitely something that I'd like to look at, uh, the, the foreign policy and, uh, and other implications of that decision. But certainly it's a very attractive decision. Uh, there are refugee advocate, advocates who've spoken to me about about that being at least a very good interim position and so it's definitely on the table. Well Karen Phelps congratulations once again and thanks for joining us. Thank you Barry.